Friday, June the 5th. I tried to kill myself today. I ran the bath and attempted to drain myself, but I misjudged the size of the tub and found myself unable to squeeze myself into it. I don't regard myself as being overly tall, but apparently the bathroom people do not design their tubs with baptismal style submersion in mind. No matter what position I found myself in, the water refused to take me. I'll take my suit to the dry cleaners in the morning and I'll try again tomorrow night. Saturday, June the 6th. I bumped into Julie on the way to the dry cleaners. She was with Patrick, my replacement, and the baby in its pushchair. I'm still uncertain of its age, but I know it didn't arrive till after she was done with me. At times like these, I tell myself that I'm not trying to off myself because of Julie and her seemingly perfect life. I didn't really have a rational explanation as to why my suit was soaked through. The logical excuse was that it had been raining, but annoyingly the rain hasn't appeared for several weeks now. To be fair to myself, it was never really my intention to explain why my suit was wet, as floating face down in the tub when the neighbours found me would have been enough in the way of exposition. So, for their benefit, I concocted an explanation which went something like Yeah, I was like uh, fixing the sink and it was leaking and I had the suit on and it was a big mess and... I don't think they bought it. I refused to pay the dry cleaners for a bag and instead decided to carry my newly dry cleaned suit. Yeah, that came back to bite me. I decided, and I believed I'd be in luck this time, to employ the services of a toaster in my latest attempt to separate myself from the living. So, I filled the tub again, but decided I'd give the bubbles and the candles a miss. In retrospect, the bubbles were probably more of a hindrance last time, but what can you do? Dying in comfort, am I right? The bathroom has no plug point. It never has, so... I don't know why this was a surprise to me. Therefore, there was no place to plug in the toaster. Making the most out of a bad situation, I just thought to myself, screw it, let's just drop the stupid thing in anyway and hope the electronics inside are enough to do the job. Safe to say that didn't work. And now, now I'm the proud owner of a damp, inoperative toaster and an extra day in this spinning ball of dirt I did not intend. Sunday, June the 7th. Argos refused to take back the toaster. According to my receipt, it was well within its warranty, but the toaster's waterlogged state prompted a negative response from the two store colleagues and the manager I had the displeasure of addressing. Apparently, and I didn't know this, it is uncommon for a toaster to leak water. So uncommon, in fact, that it isn't even listed as a possible reason for return. Despite the toaster's clear state of disrepair, the kind folk at Argos denied me an exchange and I politely told them how to do it themselves. Again, I don't really plan on using the toaster in the foreseeable future, but the fact that I spent £12 on an appliance that won't even electrocute me in the bath isn't a glowing review for Argos's products. Monday, June the 8th. My next attempt to relieve myself from reality was old school, but despite measuring the rope correctly before I took a stroll off the kitchen counter, it was too long and... Fuck! <sighs> Ideally this job should be quick and painless, I don't expect to be kneecapped on the way down. In theory, self-inflicted death should be a simple task, but instead here I was, Crying like Jackie Kennedy on the couch, nursing myself with a box of frozen fish fingers. To make matters worse, I can't eat those fish fingers now because the fall from grace also knocked over the drying rack where I keep the plates. I'll go to Argos tomorrow and buy more plates. But not that Argos. A different Argos. Tuesday, June the 9th. I met Julie this morning. I don't really know why I indulge her with coffee and overpriced pastries, but it continues to occur. I doubt it's healthy to be so intertwined with your ex's life, but I suppose I'm not looking for health. For some inexplicable reason, 
I'm the first one she calls. I don't know if that's laziness or if she's just a terrible judge of character, but I'm equally to blame for answering. Julie tends only to speak in hyperboles about the same topics, work, shoes, the baby, whose name and gender I still don't know, or Patrick. I have it in good mind that she misinterprets my boredom as depression. But I'm not depressed, honestly. I'm just pretty sullen about the fact I still can't off myself. The films make it look easy, don't they? They don't show you the bit when you sit in the middle of a level crossing for hours only to find out the trains have been cancelled. I'm starting to think that somebody wants me to stay here, or rather, I think somebody doesn't want me over there. Julie claimed she had something important to tell me about the baby, but I think she bottled it in the end. Or maybe she did tell me and I was miles off, wondering about how many pastries I could eat before getting type 2 diabetes. Wednesday, June the 10th. Patrick showed up today, just as I was preheating the oven. So he could continue Julie's aborted conversation about the baby. I told him, It seems slightly odd talking about the baby without actually being here. But he kept on breathing anyway. Apparently, the baby's actually mine. Normally I'd be more impressed, but as its name and gender have so far eluded me, and both Julie and her prat of a boyfriend only seem to refer to it in awkward euphemisms, you can see my problem. <clears throat> Due to my newfound fathership, as the ever stupid Patrick put it, it was implied that I was to have some kind of custody, presumably so they had someone to dump it with. I'm doubtful that this whole situation was above board, but quite honestly, I was more bothered about whether you even need to preheat the oven before you stick your head in. I don't know what kind of oven Sylvia Plath was pushing, but I couldn't even get my whole face in the stupid thing, let alone my head. What kind of oven do you need to do the job? Is it a specific type? A pizza oven or something? Surely Plath didn't have a pizza oven. I still haven't bought new plates either. I'm one foot in the air here, but I refuse to eat from a napkin like some monster. Thursday, June the 11th. Saw the baby today. Her name is Valerie, which is an awful name. Supposedly she's been alive for just over a year, which is coincidentally how long I've been single. She is a fairly large, dopey looking thing. I've never wanted children. Neither did Julie, now I think about it. Perhaps that's why she's so tuned into the idea of lending her to me. Still though, something about holding her reminded me to... Well, I don't know. Apparently, I volunteered to watch Valerie so Julie and Patrick could get away to the country for the weekend. The country being a very vague location to tell the person who's looking after your child. At some point during the conversation, I probably should have mentioned that I'm currently in the process of trying to snuff myself out and perhaps this could be a valid reason not to entrust me with a small child, but, you know, retrospect. Looking back, the weekend, it wasn't so bad. For the first hour or so, I'd sat Valerie down to watch Homes Under the Hammer whilst I prepared myself for the evening. The second hour, however, was riotous. An attempt to asphyxiate myself in the back seat of my car was rendered void by the baby's wails for food or sleep or attention or changing. An attempt to overdose in the kitchen on paracetamol and cheap wine was disrupted by Valerie's own reflux of vegetable puree I'd fed her not half an hour before. The next 20 minutes involved me hiding or discarding any potential dampers to Valerie's continued survival, as it wasn't fair for her to discover any hypodermics or ton weights or band saws that I'd bought on a whim from Amazon in some of my more desperate moments. During that first night, it seemed that I spent more time protecting the baby than I had on any night plotting my own passing. I'm not saying it's not my eventual intention to separate my soul from my body, but I was tired. I'll try again tomorrow night. As long as Julie and Patrick don't die in a horrific accident in the country and I have to keep hold of Valerie, of course. <laughs> Julie and Patrick have died in a horrific accident in the country and I have to keep a hold of Valerie. Saturday, June the 20th. It's scary to think how one minute you can be driving along a narrow country lane and the next year, involved in a bizarre combine harvester collision. 
makes you think, doesn't it? <sighs> the waxing and wearing days have not been so bad. It's been fairly rocky since the funeral, hence my words being few and far between. Valerie doesn't understand what's going on, obviously. I've just had her sat in front of the TV for most of it whilst I've been busy. Not with my usual planning, important stuff. Tax and forms and wills and whatnot. Valerie's favourite TV programme now is the Andrew Marshall. She'll sit and giggle at it. Unaware that there's a whole unexplored channel called CBBS just beyond the realms of teapot politics. I think I'll miss Julie. Despite the fact I had no time for her. We were relatively happy once, as all couples are, but... As time pushed by and I resented her for every tiny quirk from her constant need to be right to her possibly stubborn nature, I began to realise we were just too similar. Still, those chance meetings and prescribed coffee dates did seem to have some effect, to the extent that I've moved her pictures back out of the storage boxes and onto display once more. So, yeah, I will miss her. I will not miss Patrick. Apparently he played darts semi-professionally, which has somehow made me despise him more in his posthumous state. Wednesday, June the 24th. For some reason unbeknownst to me, Valerie still refuses to watch CBeebies like a normal child, preferring the Monday daytime TV tailored for students, the unemployed, borderline alcoholics, if, you know, they aren't the same thing. It's not for lack of trying to move her onto the friendler stuff though. I found a box set of Pingu in the local Oxfam, but she seems to detest the adventures of a stop motion penguin almost as much as I despise a less tired version of myself. I haven't had the energy to even attempt to bump myself off now for several days. I've only been tempted once so far, after I bought child safety plugs from Asda and contemplated sticking a fork in the socket before I sealed it over. It's funny how the appointment of a small child is all it takes to stop you from electrocuting yourself. Not that she'd notice. She'd be too engrossed in Andrew Marr's ears to notice me evaporating. Friday, June the 26th. Julie's birthday. Your kid's not bad. Monday, June the 29th. I took a trip to Argos this morning with Valerie. I'd forgotten about the toaster incident until I passed through the door, but they had to. I'm quite pleased with my new purchases. Plates. Plastic ones, so no more accidents. And a new toaster. It was on special discount in their clearance section, so I'm doubtful that it'll work any better in the tub than its predecessor. But I'm in no rush to try. I've gone back to writing. Not diary writing, proper stuff. Screenplays mostly. Anything I can sell to keep the flat running and Valerie out of childcare. I'm not against childcare, by the way. I'm just against not being there for her. Truth is, I think I need her more than she needs me. I think she's the only thing stopping me from hopping off the kitchen counter again. For the first time since Julie and I got together, I'm feeling like I have a purpose. I'm getting on okay. I feel anchored. So, perhaps I'll pass on my quest for death for now. Just so Valerie has someone. Then again, with that constant crying, don't think I won't try again tomorrow night. <laughs>